Thank you very much for being here with us. Um, tell me your name and your affiliation. Yeah, my name is Sebastian Makowski. I'm a partner at Blockchain Valley Ventures, which is a leading digital asset advisory company uh, combining digital asset advisory, which we do for large corporates, um, but also having an own investment fund. And, uh, and I'm building particularly uh, the corporate finance practice and investment banking, helping blockchain companies to raise equity funding. In the future, probably also digital equity or security token funding or other forms of, of innovative funding, but for now, mostly equity. So these are three different uh, branches, three different activities. Uh, let's start with the first, mm -hmm. uh, your corporate clients. Uh, what kind of uh, activities do you recommend for a large uh, company that comes to you and says, what should we do? Yeah, so very different. I mean, it can go very nitty gritty and be very detailed. Um, it can be very much along the lines of what they are already doing. Yeah. So an example is, for example, uh, the, the Swiss Digital Exchange, uh, which, which is launching their, their digital exchange for the Six Group, which is the Swiss uh, Stock Exchange. Um, <clears throat> that, that's one example. Another one can be a large luxury consumer brand that uh, wants to think about tokenizing parts of their value chain in order to make to make their uh, yeah, production process more resilient towards copycats. Um, I personally think longer term, the, 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 the holy grail in advisory and, and digitally or decentrally transforming industries will be around identifying the core assets of companies, uh, which can be uh, production processes, but can be, can, can be users, audiences, uh, clients, etc., and leveraging those assets into an area that's not conflicted with their core business because the global boards will, will resist in, in sacrificing the ongoing business for new business, but leveraging those assets at, at ideally 100% of face value into an adjacent area where you could then go full steam ahead with the central business strategies. Uh, so I think this is something that we will see happening over the next years. But, uh, but that's a ho very wholesome effort. So I, I think about this in a little bit in the realms of, of the Libra announcements. Uh, while I still think there should there is a huge conflict of leveraging those 2 billion Facebook users into something that's still somehow a social media, social commerce product. While there are other ways to leverage those 2 billion into other areas where uh, I think the world of Facebook will probably have less resentments. The second uh, is an investment fund. What is the thesis there? So our thesis is we, we are all um, professionals with uh, 15 plus years of, of experience working for large institutions. So we clearly come from the, from the traditional side. Yeah? So we have identified three sectors that we want to go in that, that we know well, which is uh, one is open finance. That's a broad term. Reason for that is, I mean, we see most of the activity in that space currently. I think the utopian models are a bit in the back at the moment and, and uh, the discussion around base layer protocols is, is not, uh, not uh, led daily. So um, open finance come going from exchanges to everything that you need in order to, to attract institutional capital, which is the next wave that's, that's due to happen or is currently happening. But the infrastructure, which can be custody, KYC, AML, settlement, uh, etc., all those kind of infrastructure pieces and building blocks which, which are needed, uh, that's an area where, where, we, where we look at very deeply. The way we look at that is we have friendly, friendly uh, corporates that, uh, that we share deal flow with. So it, we can never do the due diligence uh, that, that a, a Goldman Sachs or, or an Avalok or others can do. They are very versed in that. And uh, so this is the way we, we, we deal with them. We, we show them good deal flow. They look at those opportunities as a means of integrating them and, and selling them also to their clients. Uh, and this way we get a lot of the risk of investing at late seed stage out of the business uh, or out of the investment and investing, trying to invest at seed stage, but with a risk profile of a Series A. That's kind of the... What is uh, your typical ticket size and geographical area of investment? Um, geographical area is, is global, although we have made most of the investments in London. Uh, we, we were planning to do most of them in Switzerland, but London is, is still the hub for, uh, for blockchain companies in Europe. 
Uh, ticket size usually ranges between 300,000 or even less than that and 500,000. It's, it's small. We are about to raise our uh, first real fund, which will be a global fund. It's also part of the Draper Venture Network. So we'll have offices in, in we have an office in Singapore, in, in Zurich, soon in Germany. But uh, we'll have one in, in San Francisco as well, uh, because we think you need to be global to invest in blockchain. Makes limited sense to look for the global market leader in blockchain in France. You may find it there, but that's luck. So if you want to look at the, the competition, you need to look globally, which is why we want to become one of the leading global funds in, in blockchain. Uh, tell me about the third activity. Uh, how do you go about it and what are the specific uh, added value that you deliver uh, mm -hmm. there? So the third is corporate finance, which is very traditional uh, in investment banking. Uh, at the time when a security token offering, regulated security token offering of which we have done many, was still a retail exercise and a marketing exercise, that's now shifting towards professional entrepreneurs and that's why we are currently seeing limited activity on that front. Uh, until this picks up, we are looking uh, to, to raise just very traditional equity fundraising from growth investors, VCs, uh, family offices uh, and high net worth individuals as well as corporate VCs in, in blockchain based business models. Those models are usually, uh, those businesses are usually quite mature. They have three, four, five million revenues they are going to generate in the year they, they transact. But on the back of this you, you can do relevant equity fundraising yeah, in between 10, 15, 20 but also uh, beyond that millions. and. Uh, the service we, we offer usually is uh, companies come to us because we, we know the market, we know blockchain, uh, that's something that not a lot of people can, can provide. Um, I think we stick out because we have a relevant experience, we know all the, the leading funds, we know what they like, what they don't like, looking at the KPIs of a business, strategizing about what you want to do in digital businesses and in blockchain businesses, you will, it's always easy to, to conquer another country or another five countries. Now that's, a, that's something you can do in three, four, five months with a traditional business that's impossible. But that's why we try to be a long-term partner. We usually meet the companies uh, at the seed stage. We probably look at it with our fund. Sometimes we invest. We then uh, stay in contact. We support them on strategizing about how they should go with, with uh, penetrating the market, which clients to go first um, and building up a strategy of how they can go to market alongside also the companies that we work with. Uh, that, that may be potential clients for those um, protocols and um, yeah, and then, then we run a structured process which is a uh, yeah, very work intensive one, uh, takes about four to six months and, and in the end uh, we help them negotiate the best deal and it's an end-to-end -end service. Uh. In the traditional financial system has been very successful and uh, it is because of that success that it is unlikely that they will embrace the disruption of blockchain and uh, open finance. In Europe, at least, the regulator is pushing for interoperability in the banking sector, and sooner or later, blockchain will enter the picture too. From your point of view, is it likely or possible that the traditional financial institutions are going to be able to fully embrace this disruption or it is more likely that new players will become and replace the giants of the past? I think a little bit of both. So I see uh, all the big banks there at yeah, this point in time they are pretty switched on about the, the potential that digitalization has but also blockchain has. And the leading banks they they have been uh, spending time on this for years already. Uh, uh, and even, even we see uh, what happens in China, even governments have been spending years on, on thinking about how to make use of this technology. So I think clearly they will enter this market and there are a lot of, uh, speaking about the, the decentral transformation, I think there are a lot of assets they bring to the table naturally, which gives them a, 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 yeah, a jump start in, in entering those markets. Uh, but at the same time, of course, I mean, they, they have the problem and their boards will be critical about uh, supporting new ways of doing things that will eat away uh, of the legacy business. Yeah? On the other hand side, 
something that we particularly see is uh, customer acquisition is extremely cheap in blockchain based models that's that's uh, it's a, the greatest marketing gig that the world has ever seen traditional banks could show that they are serious about embracing uh, uh, blockchain by allowing uh, crypto businesses to open bank accounts That's Do you think that is happening already? Because uh, it is still hard. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's still a problem. So, but that 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 favors uh, disruption again. I see, I see a lot of uh, seasoned entrepreneurs that have seen this, that that know about the wealth creation that has happened in the crypto space. A lot of wealth that's sometimes stored in in in, in some cold wallet. Yeah, sometimes uh, never even has been converted to any uh, extent into into fiat. Some people store cash in a in a deposit box because they have no bank account and they just uh, convert as much they need to fund uh, developers for the next six months which is crazy if you think about it uh, but this opens up i mean if the banks reject those players i see a lot of seasoned entrepreneurs founding banks for exactly that purpose uh, which will be helping the companies to open bank accounts will provide them with products that they cannot get anywhere else treasury products etc And, and a lot of those companies still are very well funded huh? and a lot of the, the, uh, the founders uh, and entrepreneurs operating in those companies have a very relevant crypto wealth that, uh, that uh, we'll, we will probably see a lot of uh, next generation banks being created if banks don't start embracing it. And that's, that's what, we, what we see. Yeah? I think this, this customer acquisition thing which I mentioned earlier is, uh, is going to open up ways for next generation challenger banks that will be able that to even acquire customers under the levels of a N26 and Revolut uh, and, and become really huge and there is no need for a bank anymore as long as we have a mobile phone and, and getting customers is key in that sense and, and this will open up the market for the wider masses which I think is the next big wave we're going to see. Congratulations for all your activities and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, thanks for having me.